Our next session is Global Outreach Practice uh, Experience, uh, Experience Practice uh, Forum. Um, so thank you for being still awake after a long day uh, technical lectures. But this one will be exciting because you are not only the listeners, but you are also uh, the speakers. Um, so outreach, uh, in the broadest sense, is to share your study, your knowledge, and your research work, your passion to the people who are not in your profession, uh, professional community, um, so that they can understand what you're doing at the conceptual level and also to know the purpose and uh, uh, the significance of your work and they can become uh, uh, supportive. And some of them may potentially become a professionals joining your research and some of uh, them may never uh, be in doing exactly the same thing, but they can understand it and be supportive on that. Um, and this can be divided also into uh, the community within the education system, K through 16, and the academic environment, and it could be also mean uh, people in the community outside of academic setting. So therefore, um, we are trying to uh, share uh, our experience under this uh, big, uh, 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 that much. Um, okay, so it is important as we all learned from last week's discussion, panel discussion, that uh, in order to uh, connect what we're doing to the big picture, and we are all facing a big problem in the 21st century that's sustainability, it takes a great collaboration among scientists and uh, uh, policymakers, economists, uh, entrepreneurs. Um, to work together. Uh, so um, uh, outreach is important, uh, which uh, depends on everybody's effort, whether you are currently scientists, uh, educators, or students. Uh, so in this session, uh, we're trying to be somewhat informal. So we have a five uh, or six scheduled short uh, present presentations followed by uh, informal discussions. So our first speaker is uh, um, Thank you. Well, I don't know the, the oh. uh, screen disappears. showed us that it's very important to share our knowledge with general public, with people around us, people in the society, and uh, probably the best example is that uh, related to Michael Faraday, and then here on this picture you can see him giving a Christmas lecture long ago, of course, um, uh, explaining how, uh, explaining the physics behind the candle, right? Um, and so uh, this is an example of uh, a scientist delivering this information, uh, the knowledge, uh, uh, the experience, sharing it with the people um, that are non scientists. And so this is very important, and uh, um, uh, usually we have to do it and we do it in other countries, in other universities, being scientists. Um, and uh, uh, however, although we do get together to share the experience related to research, we rarely exchange experience of doing outreach. And I think that uh, having an outreach forum of the kind we have today is very important and will help us to also um, exchange the experience and best practices of doing outreach uh, around the globe. And so, uh, uh, I would like to give a couple examples of uh, good outreach practices at other University, University of Colorado at Boulder, um, and uh, what is it that we do to share the excitement of doing research uh, and being scientists with 
non-scientists, with general public um, uh, in Boulder and around the globe. And so I will give several very different examples, right, um, which uh, um, are targeted, um, targeting different types of audiences. So one example is shown in here, actually two examples. Um, we have the so-called CU Wizards show. This is the show where uh, physics professors most often um, give a lecture to uh, an audience of little kids who are usually in the kindergarten or um, in the first grades of, of the school. Um, and this, those lectures, of course, are very low level, uh, at the level where uh, even those kids can be excited about um, physics. Um, you can see some examples in here. Those, for example, often involve infrared cameras, um, and uh, uh, those kids can understand that whatever is invisible for other eyes can be invisible when we use uh, um, instruments and infrared radiation, um, and uh, that our human body is also a source of radiation in the uh, infrared region. And uh, you can see that there are pretty big audiences usually. Um, uh, in Boulder, we have uh, uh, many national labs, many um, high-tech companies, and people are often very eager to bring their kids for such a show because uh, um, maybe they, they would be happy if those kids have uh, scientific careers uh, in the future. Um, and so uh, this is very early stage in their life when they can get excited about doing science. Um, the other show which I show in here, um, the information about which I show in here, is the so-called Saturday Physics uh, series, uh, which is uh, uh, targeting the audience of uh, high school uh, students, uh, school teachers, uh, and also general public, uh, who already took the school courses, high school courses. So it's a little bit high level, um, but still um, the uh, lectures focus on explaining uh, the basic concepts on a very um, accessible level and uh, involve a lot of demonstrations too. So you can go to the web pages that uh, um, are provided in here, and this PowerPoint presentations, uh, presentation, just like many others, will be posted on the web page and you can see it later on too. I myself gave a lecture like this on uh, optical trapping and manipulation, and uh, I think that this is a really good topic to, uh, for giving such a lecture because there was a lot of excitement. You know, people don't, um, many people do not realize that you can actually move things without touching them on such tiny scales, on the scales of microns, uh, and um, uh, manipulate objects without touching them. So uh, uh, I think this. Uh, uh, the topics related to materials, to photonics, especially, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, good research areas uh, from the standpoint of view of doing outreach and explaining uh, to general public uh, the uh, research uh, and science that you are doing. So, uh, in here you can see another example which is related to the materials, um, it's a, a program which is called uh, Material Science from CU. CU is uh, Colorado University. Um, and uh, uh, in this program, we have uh, uh, the uh, uh, special materials uh, uh, toolkit which uh, are designed to explain um, some physics phenomena behind the the work of uh, materials that we use in our uh, everyday life. Um, and uh, the teachers from schools in Colorado, for example, can uh, request um, 
a lecture and also a toolkit of this kind, and then it will be delivered um, to this university. So the scientists put an effort to develop such toolkits and also uh, help um, to um, help the teachers to um, uh, deliver the first lectures, and then later on the teachers can do it on their own. Um, and in here you can see a map of Colorado. Actually, this would have to be updated because it's at least two years old by now. Uh, with the numbers showing how many uh, of such uh, material science from CU lectures have been delivered in schools in different counties of Colorado. Right? So quite a few, uh, as you can see, the numbers are quite huge. And as I mentioned, uh, already the numbers would, uh, would be much bigger by now. And you can also see the excitement of little kids um, while they are playing with, uh, uh, with those uh, materials to kids. Um, so those are several different examples of how you can do outreach uh, in universities such as University of Colorado uh, in how scientists can help general public and teachers to um, educate um, the kids uh, in general public um, and make them excited about science. Uh, now, uh, uh, the other two examples that I would like to show um, are um, demonstrating the power of uh, internet technology uh, from the standpoint of view of uh, uh, outreach and also education at uh, different levels going from uh, middle school to high school and also further to um, college. So in here you can see uh, the Physics 2000 web page which is, uh, developed, uh, has been developed at University of Colorado, um, and as you would go to this webpage, you would see very nice outlets uh, and explanations of some basic um, physics phenomena that we learn in schools, and also uh, non scientists would learn uh, um, in the university or in the college. Uh, and so uh, they are really useful. Um, even for uh, professors, for teachers who are, who are teaching those courses, um, it's really useful to uh, take those outlets and, and show them to uh, the kids because um, they explain the physics in a very visual way um, and um, they help uh, the students and uh, the kids or general public to understand uh, those basic phenomena. So, uh, this week of ITEM school is focused on um, optical tracking uh, and uh, uh, some of the basic principles uh, of optical trapping are also described on this webpage as well as the principles of laser cooling um, and uh, uh, um, other interesting phenomena that uh, um, apparently are relatively new and it's only um, a decade or in some cases two decades ago that uh, uh, they have been awarded Nobel Prizes uh, for those discoveries. <coughs> and um, the other webpage is uh, PAT, uh, Physics Education Technology. Uh, again, a lot of um, very powerful outlets. Um, currently, um, there are outlets um, uh, that uh, uh, target practically all branches of physics and all branches of science, and um, they are very useful in terms of teaching at all levels. Um, again, in here you can, for example, see the explanation of how lenses work. Um, and so all of those things can be uh, simulated um, and uh, uh, 
they are very helpful for uh, students to understand the material. Now here is another example, and uh, this one is not from University of Colorado, it's uh, from University of Rochester, where um, uh, Professor uh, Jacobs and his group uh, have developed uh, a toolkit which um, uh, is called liquid crystal mood patches. Um, and uh, those mood patches, I must say, are quite um, easy to make, right? So all you really need is two plastic films and a drop of liquid crystal, which is, can be very inexpensive. Um, and uh, they would allow you to um, explain the basic physics related to the selective reflection um, of uh, polystatic uh, liquid crystals um, due to which we have colors in here. Um, and at the same time, um, they are very um, uh, fun to play with. Um, and so the group of um, um, the group of um, um, Steve Jacobs um, can provide the um, uh, toolkit for everybody who might uh, want to repair them from around the globe. Um, I guess I was uh, editing the slide a little bit and somehow uh, things are not in the right places, but you can see the examples of how kids um, are playing with those uh, mood patches and also some of the students, including, um, say, uh, Angel, who is here in the audience, um, playing uh, and um, working on the development of such uh, um, liquid crystal mood patches, right? So, well, because the chlorostatic liquid crystal is uh, sensitive to temperature and the uh, chlorostatic pitch is changing as a function of temperature, so the selective reflection um, uh, due to this helix is also changing with temperature. So um, uh, depending on temperature, different wavelengths of light would be reflected, and therefore um, um, the different colors would visualize, for example, the features of your hand, and so on and so on. Um, and so um, uh, this is kind of physics that you can easily explain to students at different levels, including uh, the ones in the middle school, um, and um, uh, they get very quickly excited about liquid crystals and uh, uh, the ways they are used in, in modern applications. So those are all examples I wanted to show right now. Um, uh, perhaps we should give a chance for others to show, but if you have questions, um, as the other presenter would connect the computer, I could uh, answer those. Okay. Uh, next uh, presentation is given by uh, Jin Wen from Zhejiang University of China. So, are there questions? So just now you want to talk about uh, the outreach for the kids and high, sc high, street, uh, high school students. Uh, so now I will talk about the, um, uh, how to motivate the undergraduate students in China. So, uh, you know, uh, 
Today, a lot of um, uh, Chinese students and researchers in different universities uh, all over the world. So, um, and most of them uh, finish their undergraduate uh, education in China. And uh, you know, there, uh, today there's uh, 30 million uh, undergraduate students in the university in China. So just imagine if uh, we just uh, motivate one percent of the undergraduate student to love uh, science or technology. So that's a huge uh, contribution to the academic uh, com uh, community. So uh, today I'll talk about uh, education in optics or photonics and uh, especially in Zhejiang University and then uh, the creative activities uh, and at last the early research experience in the lab. So, um, in Zhejiang University, uh, you know, Zhejiang University is top, uh, number one in uh, optics and uh, photonics in China. And uh, basically, optic, uh, photonics is con contains physics and engineering. So, the uh, education for undergraduate uh, uh, contains two parts. Uh, one is physics, some, such, a, uh, such as uh, electrodynamics and quantum mechanics. And this is the most important. And uh, also engineering, such as ele uh, electronics, computer science, and me um, me uh, me uh, mechanery. Uh, also, we have the uh, education plan for all the undergraduate students. There's a four year for undergraduate student. The first, uh, the first year, uh, they study and everything. They don't uh, choose a special. Uh, major, they just uh, study uh, calculus, physics, and engineering. Uh, the, the second year, they will choose a, a, a mentor or a supervisor to give them advice um, which major they, uh, they can choose and uh, uh, some advice in the courses and uh, um, uh, early research experience in the lab. And uh, the uh, uh, th uh, second year and uh, third year and the fourth year they will uh, continue their study and uh, do some re uh, research in the lab. So I'll talk about the uh, creative activities. There are a lot of um, activities in China. Uh, uh, you see there's a, a 13 contest in engineering at uh, Zhejiang University and uh, four main uh, national contests. You know, in engineering, such as the electronic design contest and the mathematical modeling and the uh, a robot uh, contest and uh, optical electronic design contest. So this uh, motivate you know, some uh, creative students to, to uh, use what they study to uh, make some device, and not just uh, study some knowledge. So uh, this is the example. When I was an uh, undergraduate student, uh, this is the first uh, uh, electronic circuit I built. It is power. So in, you know the energy and power mode is the uh, always the first thing we should consider to build a system. And later there is a, a radio uh, communication circuit and the later a uh, controller. Microcontroller with the uh, motor driver, and uh, this is the uh, also uh, a circuit. I draw the whole PCB and select the uh, electronic component and build a graphic uh, calculator, just like a mathematical. So there's a LCD with and a touch screen. We can draw the uh, graph. Graphic of the some mathematic circuit, uh, mathematic circuit, uh, and this is more examples put made by a team that uh, composed of three students and grad students. They used up uh, uh, two years to finish all the, this project. There's a a, a, a toy car used a, a solar cell. And uh, there's uh, the, this car with uh, only two wheels and uh, can balance balance it itself. And there's some um, other uh, cars or uh, um, robot. Uh, 
and also, you know, um, electronics in, is interesting, but it's not the whole story of the science. And uh, to make the make the students to uh, go into the lab to, to study and work with the PhD student, we have a lot of projects to support them uh, to go into the lab, have some early research experience uh, when they, uh, they are uh, undergraduate students. Basically, we have the National Undergraduate Innovative Experiment Program and also uh, Zhejiang Province and Zhejiang University uh, uh, Student Research Training Program. So, this, this is an example for National Undergraduate Innovative in innovative experiment program. It's two years and they have approximately 3,000 US dollars funding. So this is the liquid uh, crystal display they made in our clean room. So this is the pictures. And also there's another program, SRTP program, to uh, make a way by our clean rooms. Yeah. Uh, also, we have some uh, international activities such as short-term exchange program to U.S., Europe, uh, Singapore, and also this is ICANN, uh, 2009 uh, summer school. Uh, some of the undergraduate students also attended. we try to do our best. So our uh, main efforts are directed to the uh, high school students and to the uh, first year uh, college and university students. Uh, we try to recruit uh, them to make some researches and to attend to the lectures and something else. So, what uh, we had for the uh, schoolmates? Uh, we have so-called uh, small academy of science in different fields, in different branches, something, something like uh, chemistry, physics, mathematics, information technology. Uh, this schoolmates come to the university, to the big lecture room, uh, where the professor um, gives him a lecture in different fields optics, photonics, maybe mechanics sometimes. After the lecture, uh, the students uh, have to prepare some reports or some practice to demonstrate some small experiments, maybe something like that. Uh, the second way we have to interest the students to make some research is the uh, um, state-sponsored so-called Olympiads, also in physics, in mathematics, in chemistry. Uh, these Olympiads take place in regional level and in the state level, and the winners uh, have some funds and some preferences uh, when they are attended to enter the university. So also we invite, uh, we invite uh, the first year students uh, to come to the lab and to start their researches in different fields. And we are trying to interest them uh, by doing small presentation small practice, small experiments. I think that's all. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dennis from Colorado University at Boulder. Give me a 
second. Uh, Meanwhile, are there questions to previous speakers or you know, participants? Well, I have a limited scope of outreach in, in, only in how it relates to uh, the United States. Um, but I, I'd like to give my, my two sentences, I think, on, on why outreach is so important in the U.S. Uh, and I think there, there's two reasons. There's like a uh, some like comical reason and a, and a serious reason. Uh, my comical reason is, you know, anytime I, uh, I don't like to tell anyone I'm a physicist. It seems to create some sort of barrier. You never at a club or something, you're, you know, someone asks you what you do, and you're a physicist, and they're like, oh, like, you know, I, I, I don't know. It, it doesn't, you know, like, it, it seems like, you know, if, you, if it, you, know, you tell them some other major, like, psychology or something, that, that's cool, but physicists, you know, there's this narrow stereotype associated with physicists uh, in the United States. It's definitely not like, there's no celebrity physicists so much. But, uh, I'm just telling you're a wizard. Yeah. And the, and the, uh, my, my serious on, uh, answer um, is there's a history of underrepresented minorities in the United States. I mean, so that, you know, there's the, uh, the black population, there's also the Hispanic population, and the Native American population. And uh, I, uh, it's important to, I think, to, to lend a hand down to these, to these groups. <sighs> because, uh, I mean, I, so I've been working with some of the other minority students for a while, and it, I'm just looking at my notes. Okay, so there's there's poverty that definitely keeps like so so you know if you're, if you're black or Hispanic in the United States, you're you're likely to be poor, and this and then this gets translated into school districts because if you're in a poor neighborhood, the schools are funded locally. So if you're in a poor neighborhood, the school is going to be poor. Your education is not going to be like the education that one would receive, say in Boulder, one of the you know a rich suburb of Denver. So there's one reason. And also there's the, the, the culture aspect. So I was doing some outreach in, uh, in, in Longmont, which is a, yeah, it's a town of uh, In Longmont, which is a city, it's kind of a suburb of Denver, but it's not like Boulder. I mean, it's, it's where all the Hispanics do. Uh, the Hispanics tend to live in, in, in Longmont. You go there and you ask the kids, you know, what do you want to go? And, and, and you ask, you know, a young lady, 14 or something, she says, I want to be a mom. You know, I want to get pregnant. That's, that's their, and then, you, you know, you ask the guy, I want to do construction. Well, there's nothing wrong with those answers. You know, it, none of them wanted to be scientists, and their families don't. Like, I did private tutoring for some of them, and, and you feel like these students, you know, their parents don't want their kids to be scientists. It's not something that's looked up upon. So to get, to get this measure that science is okay, and like, you know, us physicists or chemists or mathematicians or, or normal people, um, it's something important to get across. Um, I, I think it's important for outreach to go on on all levels. So not only reaching kids, say, at the, the kindergarten level, um, but you also need to get them at the high school level and the college level, and, and as well as, the, as, as you know, the early career kind of level. Uh, so I think there's two types. You can do individual outreach or you can do group outreach. So I've done, you know, I've tutored low-income uh, students and things like this. Uh, but also involved in like, stuff like SPIE. So I started the SPIE chapter in Colorado. We've done some outreach, and even before I was at Colorado, I was in another institution, a smaller one, and, and we also did some outreach. And we did stuff like, like this. So now I can uh, pull up some pictures. So one of the things we did was, this was the uh, Colorado Science Fair, uh, so statewide. And uh, luckily, SPIE wanted a fund, and they gave us some prizes, like I think two hundred dollar prizes for all these little kids. And let's see if I can find a, a good kid here. Uh, so this guy, uh, he won one of the prizes, and uh, it's amazing to see these these kids do science. Let me find some, one today. Oh yeah, this this is good. She killed a bunch of bacteria with UV light, and uh, she won. These are all the winners. Um, they they. Uh, 
I'm trying to find this one little, this guy. All right. <laughs> this guy's amazing. All right, so he, he built this little car that connects, which are these little things you can uh, connect. And he put a little uh, battery and a little control system, and this car could, like, drive around. And it worked by, like, he had a little, um, what is it, photo diode on there. So if you flashed a flashlight on it, it would, you know, sense the flashlight, and it would turn the motors. And if you turned the flashlight to the right or the left, the car would also turn. And I didn't believe this kid, because he had this all wired up, so I was looking at a circuit and like, what's that, what's that, what's that? And he's like, oh, it's a resistor, and there's a diode, so it goes this way, and there's a, you know, a voltage range. <laughs> so he got first place. Uh, so we do things like that. Uh, but then also at the college level, you know, we go... Alright, so... Um, So, uh, you know, so this is more at the college level, uh, this is SPIE, there's an annual conference every year where we, you know, it's a student leadership conference. Uh, they gather like 150 students from around the world together and, uh, and just talk about leadership and how to, how to kind of carry the message of optics uh, forward. And I guess I'll conclude because I want to go to dinner. Um, <laughs> let me make sure I covered all my, my notes. All right, uh, I think I'll conclude with uh, something that uh, we have a professor at our college, Noah Finkelstein, who, who recently just testified in Congress in the United States about the state of education in America. And, you know, America used to be like nearly number one always on math and science and stuff, and now we're starting to fall like way down the list. Like it was 17 a couple of years ago, like on the list, and now we're like 20 something on the list, you know? So we're falling. Uh, and it's important that we, that we reach kids at a younger age so we can stay competitive globally. Oh, one thing that he always says in his talks, and I will kind of paraphrase and re repeat it. Uh, so DNA is how culture replicates itself, obviously. Or, I mean, uh, how, how life replicates itself. So DNA is like how you know, our genes get passed along. Uh, I always say that education is how culture is passed. And, and so if we're not educating the youth, nothing's ever going to change.
So this is our selection criteria for hiring new faculty. And this is a typical uh, course for four-year physics majors. So I'll leave that uh, past that. So here are a couple of examples showing you undergraduate research, which we found it out interesting. When we do outreach, we have our physics students doing outreach, which come back to motivate them doing research. So this is the type of research uh, our students would be very interested in. The first one is a demo set that is sponsored by NASA. Two both projects are sponsored by NASA, probably around the 10,000 range. So the first one is demo set. So we'll see how students get excited to have a payload launched by balloon uh, and uh, uh, with the um, uh, capability of detecting uh, uh, temperature and pressure as the balloon goes up. And then the whole thing is amassing in the public and so that there are so many people coming to watch the event. So that motivate our students at the same time uh, inform the public about this type of research. Um, so they put the uh, a payload on this uh, balloon and uh, launch it in the open area, um, then they will come back to collect the data. <laughs> this is <laughs> green, <laughs> open field. Very quick. Okay, so there's a website. Dr. Walsh is a uh, uh, project uh, leader on this. So the second one is robot. This robot is sponsored by NASA, and students are excited about doing this project. It is a very uh, interesting one. It uses a, a computer internet webcam with a lot of sensors on its 200 pounds a robot, and then they go out to show uh, high school students offer courses to have uh, uh, high school students to take uh, uh, classes on the robot, and, and it's also G GPS guided. Okay, I'll show you a very short video that I recorded. Yo, what happened? I'm sorry. This one? This is a uh, back door of our uh, last hall physics building, and it goes down. Okay, I don't have the pictures of how they do outreach part, but this is a um, type of research our students are doing. Okay, I'll stop on this first part, and I'll go quickly to the second uh, half. That is how we teach general education course to for the outreach purpose, and that is to inform math science majors in our institution so that they can also go out to inform the public. This is sort of an indirect outreach. Uh, effort uh, in which the curriculum for energy education, energy and environment course, how we teach it uh, in a different uh, manner. Uh, we use an online course management program to update information. For example, like all of this research going on last week uh, could be easily incorporated into a course. Then we have hands-on projects and make connection between school and community, make a connection between science and art and discuss the issues from a global perspective as uh, initially the faculty that study a program. Okay, um, so this is a course management program and we have students uh, doing various projects um, and also discuss within the course uh, forum uh, and we also have students working on various projects related to energy and environment, renewable energy and so on. And they also present it in the classroom make uh, diesel, uh, fossil diesel, or uh, fossil, uh, I mean, uh, biodiesel, and uh, all other kinds of uh, energy-related products. Okay, um, and uh, the course was, uh, 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 there are many athletes recorded for the course, and uh, there are students coming back, um, showing, um, designing a new project for uh, new students. From, this is projects designed by previous students. So we also collaborated with uh, Colorado and the Science uh, Center, 
and we also go for data collection, analyze the energy use in uh, houses. So uh, they talk uh, to the to the homeowners on this, and then uh, also collaborate with, uh, with the clean energy um, alternative vehicle project, and making connection with the making biodiesel to the, to the expert in another institution. And science and art connection that will uh, inform non-science majors in our institution. Uh, so I gave a number of presentations invited by art professor to art students. So they came up with uh, a lot of the interesting ideas that illustrating their understanding of energy and some science concepts. So this is their painting. On that. So finally, uh, we offer this course to involve uh, in-service teachers uh, to take this uh, energy courses. So uh, they go out to tell kids about the uh, science project in this area. So I will end uh, my talk at this point. So, um, in Scotland, well, I've run outreach activities for about five, six years now, and what I've found very exciting is how it actually infuses PhD students very much in my group. In fact, we've also had uh, now a dedicated science communicator for two years. Um, we do the normal range of activities, uh, just, but we also do things that might be a little bit unusual. So, here's one, one example of that. So, what we decided to do was, we've all heard a lot about engaging young people, but as we know, many of the technologies that photonics and will engage with healthcare is going to impact actually on middle-aged people and older people much more quickly. And these people obviously will have somebody in their lives or in their family who's been afflicted by disease, and it's incredible how they're very much aware of new technology coming through and how much they want to understand what it can do for them. Um, you'd be quite surprised, even myself, the number of letters I get from people who are, have incurable diseases or something, and maybe you've heard about something I'm doing or a colleague is doing at the university. This actually has multi various um, impact because in, the, in my first slide this morning, you saw we put up a new medical school. Many universities are expanding, and when they go to the local communities and say, should we do more science, should we put this here, people object to you because it ruins their view or it is something they don't like about it. If you engage the public, then they actually understand why we need to do research, why those people can have a say. So then a part of the community that we felt were maybe slightly overlooked. So in that case, we actually spent a little bit of time going to see them and actually showing them what life could do. We also have, for example, many exciting demonstrations. For example, you've already, some of you know a lot about organic light emitting dyes. We have, for example, photodynamic therapy. Uh, one person at our university has developed a light bandage to do turn inpatient into outpatients. They basically wear a battery pack and they walk around, and this is fun to do, being done with a hospital. And people really engage with that. Um, so we do a lot of that, uh, and, down, and the photos down there show you some of the things we do with kids. I like to make things very interactive, as I tried to do a little bit this morning. Uh, we don't do very passive demonstrations. What we do is get them talking and then get them asking and answering even the most trivial questions from the word go, and then they go off and do some demonstrations. So that's, um, and also we did a little bit of fun, and I'm happy to share this, we did a little bit of understanding of the questions you should ask people. 
to find out if it's good. In other words, how do you, how do you make a questionnaire for a 12 year old to actually understand if he or she's understood it or enjoyed it? So that's the type of thing we've got. Uh, we've got many variants. We did some interactive processing and thinking about that, and I'm happy to share that if anybody's interested in how you get feedback on what went well and what didn't go well in outreach. Because it's, it's fine coming home and being happy with your demonstrations and all but was it really useful for them? How many people there really got, what do they really like about it? So that's actually something really worthwhile looking at in how you evaluate it. Um, I'm just going to few, but just a quick one to show you. So we've developed a number of very cheap exhibits that are really quite nice. So here's one, reflection and refraction through fluorescein, which is a very nice way to show the bending of light in a water tank with little laser pointers or pivots. And the beam, you, know, you can't, you know, kids love playing with this. It's absolutely fantastic to show them the idea of the Fresnel equations and how light bends. Then this one, which uh, is the famous Tyndall experiment, so light going around corners. All right, so it goes through that. And then we have a little plastic fiber light, which is wonderful. So we turn the lights off, we hand the rope out to everybody, and they can understand how an optical fiber works. And everybody loves this. And in fact, that's been actually used by divers, in fact, in the North Sea for linking up and things. So it's nice and cheap. It just uses a simple 532 laser. And I'm very happy to share these ideas and how we do these. It's just, we have also, for example, a talking cell. We have endoscopes as well, which kids love. So they love it, actually. We find that they work together in groups and sort of play with each other. So the endoscope's great. We get them to look inside a watermelon or inside of a piece of fruit or a vegetable, and they love that. And then they look inside each other's mouth and things like that. And they love that because they're interacting with each other, and they're starting to think about how the optics and photonics really helps a surgeon or somebody see things. So that's the sort of thing we do. And of course, we have a little optical tweezers. Um, it's a little bit bigger than this we take out. It's a really nice little cute box that we make, and we're happy to share the design if you want. We can put it in the back of the car, and you can turn it on in five minutes. And we took this to South Africa and the USA and everything, and kids love playing with that. So I think outreach is great, but also think about your audience and think what you can do for them, and also get evaluation back. But also don't miss out parts of the community you have a local. We go to golf clubs and things, and they make you great cakes. They give you lovely tea as well. So they really treat you like kids. And, and on top of that, they're so happy to see you because they just get. You might think it, they just have little social gatherings and they go, nobody ever comes to talk to us. And it's wonderful, and you can engage with them. They're also, I, I know this is very big in the US, but we're, in the UK, we'll be honest, with the burdening budget of education, we're looking for alumni to give money, to donate money to universities. Who is it? And it's an incredibly good chance to engage really with people and say, look, we are doing something with value. We're not only training the brightest minds to come through and, and further our technology, but you might want to come and visit our labs. So really, outreach should be for all. That's really why, and and it's a great and enjoyable experience for everyone. That's all I want to say. Thank you. And what can I add to that? <laughs> Nothing much. So we do pretty much similar things to what Kishan was describing. We have a, a dedicated room uh, where we run a program called Science in Action. We have been running this program for about 15 years. It's aimed at all uh, age groups. We go to primary schools, we go to uh, high schools, we bring uh, the general public into the room. And what the room is all about is a lot of optics, because I set up originally, so that was my interest in lasers and stuff, cool stuff with lasers that it follows. So we have optical tweezers, and uh, not as beautiful as yours, Kishan, it's just normal microscope and then pyramids and, and the port for laser. But the kids love it. Um, it's not as stable as Kishan's setup, so if you are planning to, to get a setup which is stable, get Kishan's setup. I have seen it in action being unpacked in US at the SPIE conference and directly put on the table and it was working. So it's a good one. But on the other hand, you can also set up optical tweezers from scratch, like Mikano set, and uh, teach, uh, show kids how simple it is. Um, so that works as well. So what else do we do? We can take all the kids with us to schools, and we go to a very remote uh, locations. So Australia is huge. The majority of the country is empty. It's very far between the schools. And the kids from northern territories in 
far Queensland, northern Queensland, uh, have not been to many universities before. So we pack the truck and we go uh, with the optical kit to them. So we have optical kit from Optical Society of America. It's a very simple kit which shows refraction, reflection, spectroscopy, uh, and a few other tricks with uh, Fresnel lenses and stuff, and we take uh, with us. We also get a lot of uh, optical fiber stuff with us, and, and lasers, all colors, and, 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 and so on. And as I said, we go to very, very remote uh, locations. It's a long trip for our students. Our students love it. It's a, again the same story as Kishan's. We engaged our PhD students and undergrads to do it. Uh, undergrads can often not afford the time, but PhD students take a week off and go, okay, go bush, as it's called in Australia. But they go bush, and, 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 and the funds which we get for it are coming from um, uh, the um, Engineering Academy uh, and Academy of Science in Australia. So our students have won a lot of um, uh, competitions to, to gain the funding for this sort of activity. And so it's taken to, to schools, public, and so on. We bring people here to the university, and in fact, it's a great pity because I forgot to tell you that last Friday, when you, have a, when you were having your workshop, there was Laser Light Fantastic Show. As you know, it's 50 years since Laser, and a couple of my students have put on a show which was called Laser Light Fantastic, and uh, unfortunately, it wasn't as attended heavily attended as we hoped, but it was a fantastic show. So I don't think that I have anything more to add, but as I said, we, we target, I think that the only group we haven't target, ca targeted are the elderly people, and I think it's a great idea to bring the technology to them. Now, on the that note, I, 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 I have to refer to Dennis's um, uh, talk where he said that when he tells people that he's a physicist, they sort of shy away. So this is what we want to break, that sort of belief of people that if you tell them you're a physicist, you're sort of weird or nerd or whoever you are, but there's not much conversation going on after you have said that you're a physicist. So I hope we're breaking those, um, those barriers and I hope that we are bringing a lot of science into the